possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Right. It's over the bar. Good morning, welcome to the RTGA podcast uh, on the eve of the All-Ireland Championship. Myself and Rory O'Neill being joined by Ian McGinley and Eamon Fitzmaurice. Um, Jesus, how's the championship already? It feels like just last week we had the league finals. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, how are you, Enda? I'm good, I'm good, all excited. Feels yeah. like Christmas Eve, it's only championship eve, but we'll take it. <laughs> yeah, certainly will. Eamon, yourself, are you well? Enjoying the, ho- yeah. enjoying the holidays? Oh, the holidays are class, yeah, Mikey. <laughs> Get boot camp with the kids, like we were saying, yeah. Yeah, for those of you watching, every time we have Eamon on and he's not at school in his, that very, very neat office he has, he's at home, and usually the sun is absolutely blinding coming in the window <laughs> behind him. It looks a little dreary in the southwest today, I which will make the... I think it's been the wettest March on record or something, has it, has it Mikey? It so... was, yeah. April's not started too well either. No, no, no. Games pulled everywhere. Yeah. Uh, certainly, yeah, last weekend was, was a disaster. Um, okay, well, look, the championship is upon us. It starts on Saturday uh, uh, with Ulster game. Um, I think uh, chronologically, exactly which game is first on Saturday. Now, let me get this right. Uh, the, sorry, it starts with London v Sligo. Yeah, it starts, but that, that's London time. It's a different time zone, so it doesn't go. <laughs> no, London v Sligo, 3 p.m. It's the first game. we got New York Leach from 11 p.m uh in new york obviously which is actually 6 p.m which is quite late um that game's usually played at a more reasonable time and then arma antrim which is probably the well it's definitely the pick of the saturday games so we'll get on to the game shortly but seeing as we've gathered two of the brightest football minds of recent times as well as enda and Eamon here today (laughs) hey we uh, just a couple of things to kind of chew on before we get into any kind of game by game stuff um uh you said it enda a couple of weeks ago, kind of, I think you were talking in relation to our man. And you kind of, you were saying, eh, do they should they really get too wrapped up in winning an Ulster Championship? You know, kind of. And since then, everybody's been saying it. Kieran McKeever must have heard you because he came out and actually said it as an Arma mentor. And so, kind of the the question of the provincial championships and and their value and the sanity of them in the middle of the championship, what they actually do for teams, is coming up more and more. And David Power said it kind of very boldly the other day. Uh, yesterday at the Munster launch, he said, so I think the provincial championships now are in the middle. The league has gone so, so important, and you can see that people are going all out. People are not bypassing it, but the Munster championship is now becoming maybe more like a McGrath Cup, and it is a worry. That's um that's pretty stark, Enda, but it does seem that managers are looking at, like, this is it, it's a shorter season, but it's a very condensed season. There's three competitions, and in the middle of it, beginning to stick out like a sore thumb for maybe... Those at the bottom, those at the top, but maybe not the middle classes for whom it is important. But for a lot of teams, the provincial championship now might be looking like, if not an inconvenience, at least a bit of a conundrum. Yeah, just it feels to me, I remember whenever the GA were bringing in, sort of trying to bring in the championship uh, permutations and changing the thing up. And I think it was parked off. He was sort of saying and, and pretty much admitted, if we were starting with a blank sheet of paper, this is what we would look like a a national league the way it is at the minute great and then into seeded use the national league to seeds a champion league type draw in two divisions across all of ireland and and away you go and logically that's what it looks like a you could see how that would plan out but of course the biggest issue is our traditional provincial championships and trying to get the provincial councils over the line trying to get them to sign up their own death warrant was never going to happen and so they sort of admitted as much that that ideal situation, purely from a competition structure point of view, purely from a clean competition point of view, that that's the way it would be. But because we've started off with the provincial championships and there's a lot of natural reticence in terms of killing them off, and there's a lot of votes in the provincial councils, and they're not going to vote that through in a hurry, then we've ended up with this sort of halfway house that, as you say, it just doesn't feel right. Like, even I was thinking about yesterday, like so we've spent a couple of months where we were building up the National League and very much you come into the National League, it's a big one. It's so important for all the teams. We realize for the majority of teams, it's almost the most important team in terms of progression and everything else. Biggest show in town, brilliant competitive games. We all enjoy it. We come into the provincial championships and again, we start as we're doing today on today's show. 
This is the start of the All Ireland Championship. This is the big stuff now. Let's get into it. And yet, in five weeks' time, we're going to be repeating the same thing again. Okay, now we're over all of that. <laughs> the really now big we're stuff. into the proper championship. So three times in the one season, we have the conversation about this is the big one coming in. And it just doesn't make sense. And for a team psychologically to prepare and to peak themselves for each of those competitions, that's where I think it starts to fall down. And as teams become more experienced with it, I think in the fullness of time, the, the provincial championships is going to struggle to maintain their place. And I think when teams look at the fairness of it and the ability to get into the good seated positions and or the ability to make the senior championship in from the lower league positions and you're from an Ulster team, you're you're gonna feel this isn't the fairest system we've got at the minute. Yeah, Eamon, you as a Kerry manager would have spent quite a lot of time in press conferences defending the sanctity of the Munster Championship when to some people it and the Leinster Championship were kind of not dead ducks, but 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 looking pretty limp for for quite a while. Um, now with a little distance from it, and not with a personal investment in it, do you think the provincial championships have a future? Um, <clears throat> look, I I felt that um <clears throat> the model that was there, if the provincial councils had a bit of confidence and security in their competition, the model that was there, where you went first with the provincial championships. You started with your provincial, forget about McGrath Cups, forget about McKenna Cups. You start with your provincial championships. You think of, you've six months of no football. Um, think back to last January when those pre-season competitions started. Everyone was mad. There was huge crowds. People were mad going to games. They wanted to go to games. If that is your Munster championship, your Ulster championship, the same will apply. It doesn't matter. It's the winter time. There will be huge crowds going it's getting the season going, possibly have it a bit later, maybe into kind of February, mid-February, maybe before it starts. Run off your provincial championships, have the same reward in terms of a seeding for the All-Ireland series later on. Go back to your league. Your league leads naturally then into your group stages. And I that was that was the kind of proposal, wasn't it? But there was, obviously it was rejected and we ended up with this halfway house and it's almost like going to be death by a thousand cuts now where eventually everyone will get to the point of oh the provincial championships are gone so I always felt that if the provincial councils and every county had the confidence in look we know our, our Munster championship our Ulster championship our Connacht championship is important to us just start with it lead into the league lead, lead on to the championship then and it's a more natural progression up through the gears then and your graph is kind of on a a more normal route upwards rather than as Enda said there where you're trying to get up and then are you are you getting up or are you just going as you are and then you're really getting up for the group stages again um look with the, with the Munster Championship the Munster Championship was always important to us it was always important to to Kerry uh just speaking with the Kerry hat on the the six years I was in charge we won it every year we went out to win it um was that because it was hugely valuable to us in terms of the actual Munster Championship in its own right. No, um, we wanted to win every competition we entered, but we also felt it was the best way to win in All Ireland to get into a quarter final, be in the quarter final, get your preparation right for that. But <clears throat> depending on the season, some seasons we got seriously tested in the Munster Championship, and that made for better preparation for the All Ireland series other years not so much and wasn't as good preparation and I think sometimes especially in comparison to the Ulster Championship when we talk about the Ulster Championship you know that it's so competitive is that a good, a good or a bad thing I always was envious of the Ulster Championship looking in from the outside because if you're a county that wants to win in All-Ireland you want to be tested constantly and I feel that that's <clears throat> one of the biggest strengths of the Ulster Championship is that by the time you get to Crow Park, you're well and truly road tested and you're, re you're ready for whatever's going to come there. Whereas there was seasons we got to Crow Park and we were undercooked and we had to try and get through a quarter final game. And then you were ready after that. But um, long winded answer to what you were asking there, Mikey. But to go back, I, I like like I said, I'd love to have seen provincial championships first, big crowds, everyone mad for football lead on to league, lead on to the the the, the group stages yeah. of the All Ireland series then. I think I, go on India. Yeah. I, I think from the back doors come in realistically the provincials haven't been the same 
for, for me, the, the two best championship models are either the old fashioned straight knockout, which is phenomenal. <laughs> and the provincial championship champion goes on to the All Ireland semi final. Like just brilliant, brilliant championship. Uh, ruthless uh, and not very good in terms of money making. So, <laughs> or, or enough games to drive the interest over the summer. So that, that's why that has uh, obviously died, died to death. But but since then they have been watered down, and I think uh, eventually we'll probably and the, Parik Duffy said this. Uh, there was one particular interview he essentially said, "Look, I think we'll eventually end up where we need to go. It's just we have to go through this in a GA way." Yeah, do there. do only do anything for me though, Mikey. Uh, one and again, love everybody's views on this. Given the nature of the calendar and the way things are really squashed in. In time, and I'm get, I, I, we're only surmising because obviously we're at ground zero with this entire experiment. In time, could the provincial championships become a little respite for teams? You know, like if you have your become like the of, FA Cup. Yeah, like if you have your if you're if you know you're going to be in the knockout stages and you're in the Sam Maguire, like it's so pressurized. It's such a high cooker you know, full on week after week after week, and then you finish your league, you're into a league final, whereas the provincial championships may become. Now, again, that might lead into a devaluation as well, but at the same time, it may offer managements and teams and more importantly, players, the opportunity just to de-stress for a couple of weeks before the real football begins again. Now, is that a really good way to kickstart your entire football championship? Absolutely not. But I suppose maybe if you take the season as a whole, it could be something in time that morphs into this. The other thing that I would also like to mention, and I think it will, again will be interesting, don't write the repetaph just yet. Provincial councils, and Enda mentioned it, don't underestimate the power that provincial councils wield in terms of keeping things like this alive. And it will be very difficult to shift them into what Eamon mentioned where they should go, but it will be hard because they do exercise and they, they could come back. I mean, you'd imagine, like, if the biggest problem with them as far as I can see, is there's no incentive now to win them. The finals are a waste of space. Actually, the most interesting aspects to the provincial championships this year will be some of the earlier games where teams are scrapping to stay in either the senior competition mm. or the intermediate competition. Well, the semi-finals pro will be Charlton Cup playoffs for... Correct. For like the, the actual yeah. provincial finals are going to be very empty, uh, vacuous, uh, contests in a lot of ways because I just don't see what the value is in winning. Well, they're seeding. Seed. Or you go seed one or seed two, whoop de do You know, the, I don't... The other issue is with that, is that for, say, the likes of Slego, for me, the best competition for Slego to be in in the summer is the Talton. Yeah. Uh, maybe not so much Cavan. I think Cavan have a team, probably should be there. They've got promoted. They were in the Talton last year, almost won it. Uh, but for the likes of Slego and even arguably... Uh, the likes of Tipperary, those sort of teams, the, the Talton should be the right competition. It'll be some of the bigger teams whose ego won't sit with the Talton, who won't want to be in the Talton. But for other teams, the Talton is probably a better group to be in than playing your main championship of the summer against a select of Dublin, Kerry, or Dublin and two or three of the Division One Ulster sides and, and a, a Galway or a Roscommon, if you know what I mean. So, I... Uh, for, for those semi-finals and that there, the, the prize is questionable enough. And again, you would go back to the structure. I think maybe Peter mentioned it on, on the Sunday game in terms of the seeding and the awarding of those seeding for the runner-up slots and that. Mm. But again, we're, we're, we're the first rule of the dice here. I think this isn't... I don't think anybody sees this as the end format. I don't I think, think they could take point along the way. They had they had to leave some kind of jeopardy or some they had to leave some weight to the provincial so I, like I can see Peter's point but I I can see why to Rory's point they've left some value to win, to winning the provincial finals because if the, if it was literally nothing but um if if everything was already decided by the league then you really are got to the point where you you you've defanged the provincials. Eamon, I wonder just finally on this point then um managers and the media seem to kind of have already jumped to the conclusion that maybe some people reached originally that you know this is a this is going to be death by a thousand 
cuts for the provincial champions. I wonder if the public, if fans, spectators are there yet, Eamon, and will we see that reflected in attendances? Because the one thing that may convince the provincial councils of, you know, the need to move to a to a to switching the calendar or to moving the provincials to a pre championship spot would be if the crowds completely fell away. So I think it'll be interesting to keep an eye on attendances now. I don't think they'll drop in the slightest because we saw from the from the preseason competitions to the Alliance League, we're seeing it in the League of Ireland this year. People are mad to get out to live sporting events. So I, I don't think attendances are going to be damaged. No, I don't think so either, Mikey. And I think look look at this weekend, the likes of Mayo Roscommon's a huge game. Cork and Clare, Cork, you know, have a certain support base, but there'll be a huge crowd from Clare and Cusick Park. If it ends up as a Kerry Cork Munster final in Killarney, there's there's still going to be that romantic and traditional um kind of slant to those games. Uh but And some deluded Cork fans still going down and hope. Yeah, uh, it's going to it's going to happen someday. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but like the, I mean, to go to go back to Rory's point about the respite for the provincial championship, the biggest respite you'll get is actually by being beaten. Yeah, you know? yeah. And you like you know I've said this that for Mayo that Mayo it's, uh, they're obviously going to want to win and keep their winning thing going this weekend. And Kevin McSay said he wants to win a kind of championship and everything else, but. If they are beaten and they have, I think maybe five, is it five weeks to the to the group stages? Could be six, depending. Yeah. Or yeah. six if they're in the other yeah. if they're in the other group. But you know, that's that's a chance to to deload, get all the bodies right, um, build it up again and come with a charge into the group. So that you know, that wouldn't be no, you know, like I said, they're gonna be going all out to win. But if they end up in that position, similarly for us coming. It's not the worst position in the world if you're trying to win the All Ireland. Mm. Because the key is with with those group stages, <clears throat> without being dis, dis this is always the classic without being disrespectful and then you being disrespectful. <laughs> uh, there, there's going to be for a big hitter like Mayo. There's going to be very winnable games in those group stages, and three teams go through. So those are essentially your perfect priming games. And that's my big feeling for Dublin. People are saying, oh, that's Dublin. Dublin aren't going to be tested through Leinster. This is even better than that. They've got a nice ramp up of games where there'll be a nice mix of top teams and weaker teams within that group of four. And then they come out of that and then you're in their championship proper. So that section you can get, as Eamon says, you can get your four or five weeks of decent training in now. And I think Dublin will be training rightly through the, the Leinster championship. And then there's those serious wee group games, which is your final bit of sort of National League, your real warm-up, and bang, you're into the big championship. And that's where I think the various points made, the provincial championships is almost like a, a preparation block, and maybe the less you see of them, it'll not maybe do you a disservice. Yeah. Okay, so that's... That's a lot. So, so let's so let's so, so, want, so, so let's get into talk about into the RT and uh, don't be saying that. <laughs> yeah, 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 and let's get into talk about them now. <laughs> well, uh, uh, we almost we will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But Rory, we always do this. We always we always precede any big competition preview with a uh, discussion on structures. We can't we can't help ourselves. Before we get onto that, again, having two um, relatively recent intercounty managers with us, I, I I would like to get your takes, lads, on the um, the squad lists. Hmm. Which is something that, again, talking about the media and managers be more attuned to something than the public. I, as a journalist who used to cover matches regularly and now manages people who cover matches regularly, couldn't give a damn about dummy teams. I find them funny. Um, maybe person who spends a fiver on a program's a bit peeved, but like they always bring a buyer with them. They know what to expect. I don't think it's a big issue. At the same time, I also think the introduction of a squad list is perfectly sane and normal and brings the GAA in line with most modern sporting organizations. Um, so, and uh, I see John Kiley is not happy <laughs> because he would like to have until Friday evening for the squad to be announced because he doesn't think he, 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 he it doesn't fit obviously into how he names his squad and lets people know whether they're getting a jersey or not. He obviously does that on a Friday evening. So he's, that's it's very clear it's a set it's a, his is a self-interest and he's he's not hiding that but the ga are saying a thursday afternoon um a do you think it's a good idea and b do you think it should be on a thursday this is splitting hairs in my opinion but seeing as john kiley hey, i I, th I can completely understand it i think it's a good idea my my issue 
is, is actually a separate one. You always have to have an issue. My issue would be that the Croke Park want your team and panel and that there by Thursday morning. Mm. And then it's been released to the public on Friday. So it, it's the same sort of timeline for management teams remain the same. It goes public Friday morning, although we're sending it in or county managers send it mm. in Thursday morning. For me, Thursday morning, given that the vast majority of teams train on a Thursday evening, given that now between a lot of championship games, there's six or seven days. So you're only four days into that or three days into that. And you're expected, you're you're having to leave Tuesday evening training with your team pretty much sorted in your head. Mm. And there's lots of knocks and there's lots of weighing up and consideration of the next opposition in terms of your matchups and everything else. So to want a team named on Thursday morning, it's not out of badness that managers aren't in a position to do that. You're literally coming to Thursday evening training. You can pick up, and I, I did even in my two years, pick up injuries on that Thursday evening training. And then suddenly a fella, you're putting on the 26 or starting them. You're both, really, if somebody's dropping out completely the squad. And whenever they see the team sheet, they realise that that's a change. That's not a great confidence boost to that player. Mm. you know. So I would prefer, I'm, I'm don't have an issue with the Friday morning announcement of a 26 plus four. And I think that's a 26 player and a four reserve list. I think that four will be used mm -hmm. uh, to muddy the waters as much yeah. as possible for opposition because county managers are paranoid. You, uh, your paranoia runs rife. But uh, I would prefer if Crook Park didn't have to know any team until that sort of Friday morning, Friday midday thing so that a management team can sit down after Thursday evening when for most counties that's their final session after Thursday evening, pick their team, select that, and then away they go. And uh, you're only paranoid if they're not all out to get you. You know, if they're all out to get you, then you're not they're paranoid. Always out to get you. <laughs> Eamon, what's your take on this? No, I'd be the same. But then I think, look, I I don't see the big deal in pushing it back to the Friday morning to submit your teams to Crow Park by 10. And I'd be for announcing them then at whatever time on Friday, whether it's lunchtime Friday, whether it's 10 o'clock Friday night, the one thing is that you'd like a consistency of approach across the whole of the championship. Some teams announce this half an hour before the game. There's no nothing published everywhere. Other teams announce it on a Friday night. James Horn had got into the habit of announcing it on a Tuesday night last year. Just that there's a consistency. It'd be great for everyone that the whole thing is released um, at whatever time on Friday. To suit John Kiley, we can go to 10 o'clock on Friday night. Uh, but that they all come out together, I think would be great. I agree 100% with what Enda said, just from the practicalities, get Thursday night over, particularly with the quick turnarounds, have your squad, that's going to be your squad for the weekend. And with regard to the dummy teams, then the way managements look at dummy teams and maybe the way supporters have to look at it is when you see the 26, that's what you're looking at. You're not looking at 1 to 15. You're looking at 1 to 26. Yeah. And you're prepared for the 1 to 26. And you're prepared. This fella could start. That fella could start. They might do this. They might do that. It will change the mindset of fans as well. And I don't think that's any harm. Because why, why shouldn't it be? Why shouldn't managers have the flexibility to change? The weather conditions could change their mind. Anything could change their mind. I, I don't think it should be. I don't think there should be punishments for changing your first 15. I think that's very draconian and a bit backward. It is. And just like I said, look at it from 1 to 26. That's that's the deck you're playing with. And there there may be a few few changes. But mm -hmm. yeah, Friday morning, uh, submit your team. Friday lunchtime or Friday evening, every team that's playing that weekend is published and we all get to see it then. And it, it adds to the enjoyment for the supporters as well. I think that you can see your own team, your own squad. You can see the gang you're coming up against, who they've picked, who's out. Oh, he must be injured, so on and so forth. It just gets the conversation going on the Friday evening. So um, I think it, it, it'd be no harm if that was the way it was. Rory, in your previous uh, previous yeah. life, you would be yeah, like, look, yeah, looking like, at the teams, etc. Is it a would is it a problem for you if the team wasn't named until an hour before? Which is kind of the reality with some huge, managers now. Huge, huge, huge issue. Logan Port, go old Jerry. He starts announcing the Dublin team. There's about ten minutes to throw in, and I'm going. That's not the team. That is definitely not going to be the Dublin team that starts this match. It's about three minutes to throw in. Changes on the Dublin team, you know, <laughs> and like there's about five changes. And it's just, I just thought it was, again, sad and really sort of. But an hour before, and if the, the team, actual, like, mean, in a, like in a soccer match, if the team well, was see, an you see, hour you see before. This goes, did this, with this, this goes back to it. They brought that rule in, Mikey, where the, 
the managements were expected to submit their starting 15s within an hour beforehand. But sure, I like what fines were in place or what sort of enforcement was in place. Mm. I'd say a lot of managements were probably saying, look, I'll take the fine as long as we don't find out that this guy's playing corner back, like, you know. <laughs> so I think so I think I think what they've tried to do is to try and give managements a small bit more leeway, which is you just announce your 26. You don't, then and, and then you just announce your 15 you know, give them the, the usual 45 minutes or half an hour before throw and leave a blank play page in the program with 15 blanks and a supporter could sit down and as soon as the official team is named, he slots into 15 names and away he goes. Like, okay. I mean, I just, I think we need to start behaving like a small bit more grown up about it eh, right across the board. They are trying to do their best, but I'm not entirely sure uh, if it, if all these will be adhered to as the season goes on. Okay. They're not great on enforcement when it comes to these things. But anyway, yeah. Sorry. We will get on top of the, the matches in a minute, but there is one more bit of news that came out of that briefing yesterday, um, which I think is of more significance and will definitely rile up more people than uh, dummy teams. And, uh, and that is the fact that the GA haven't ruled out Dublin playing their home and neutral games in the round robin at Croke Park. I think just saying that sentence, I don't think I really need to explain why that will annoy people, including Dublin fans who love traveling. The vast majority of Dublin fans adore going anywhere but Croke Park. And it's like they're being kept in a gilded cage. <laughs> but but from just from a sporting fairness logic point of view, how can you play your home and neutral games in the same venue? We've been having uh, a completely daft argument for years where in on one hand people are saying Croke Park isn't Dublin's home pitch yet they play all their home national league games there and then they turn around and they play so i think we all know the way of the world i think for fairness particularly come the big games like if dublin now they're starting to hit form now but if they were in a slightly dodgy patch them getting that second game in croke park is absolutely massive for their young player development and everything like that a uh, that experience of croke park is priceless a uh, their big senior day they're they're multi all Ireland winning team probably would have won the same All Irelands. I'm not saying it biased that, but I think in the longer term, uh, there is a need for Dublin not to be playing those second home games in Croke Park because some years they will be crucial and home advantage is massive. We've seen it in the National League where the teams with the four home games versus the three home games, they're much more likely to stay up. In championship games, if you've got a home venue around the country, for if you go through lots of these matches this weekend where it's 50 50, you said it with the with with the home venue, or certainly I do anyway. Mm. For Dublin, that's Croke Park, and you can't you can't have that. They already have a massive advantage with semi final and the, the the biggest games of the year being there. We we can't load the dice completely in their favor, and they have no desire for it. I think just from a CCCC point of view, it'll be handy to have that option open to them for double headers or things mm. like that. For a wee bit extra money, if it was a particularly plum tie, they want to go to Croke Park and have that. So uh, I can see what they're doing, but in the interest of fairness and for Dublin, I, I, I think they're better to try to avoid it at all costs. Yeah. Eamon, I suppose the, the issue here is that, you know, Dublin still technically say Parnell, Parnell Park is their home ground. Even the, the Hurlers are playing in Croke Park in the round robin this year. Now, they've got a couple of pretty good home games. They've got Galway and Wexford at home, so they will... There are two, two sets of supporters who will travel to the extent that might test Parnell Park. That's Dublin's problem. It's been a problem for years and it's the cost of land, etc., etc. means that Dublin aren't really, despite all their commercial success, in a position to just like magically build a 20,000 seater stadium that will suit them for these purposes. So we're in this kind of never, never land where no, no, Crow Park isn't our home, but we'll still play all our significant games there. And that it's a, it is, it's a problem for the GA in terms of from fairness point of view. But I, as I said, it's also a problem for the supporters who I think are kind of robbed of the experience that fans from other counties get. Absolutely, Mikey. Um, can you remember when Mikhail Park was closed and they were developing it? What did Mayo do for their league games? They went to their neighbours. They went yeah. to Ross Common. They went How to... far is Talton? Um, uh, ta <laughs> Talton? From the north side where uh, Talton, a lot of Dublin Talton. fans come from? Not very far, not very far. I'd say... I'd say Brian O'Biogliak is further from Killarney than most dubs would be from Park Talton. So uh, there's a solution. They can play their home games in Park Talton and uh, um, the neutral game can be Crow Park then. 
Oh, yeah, it's definitely the championship started the carry bands throw, throw, <laughs> throwing grenades I like it I like it um, okay let's get on to talking about some matches here then because you know it is starting this weekend um, uh, London Sligo we will leave that one play out we're talking about the Division 4 champions against the team at the bottom of Division 4 even allowing for the home advantage that, that End is talking about and the home advantage is good there I won't go into it now because we do want to get on to the game but if you have a chance have a read of Lee Keegan's column today on the RT website it's quite funny talking about uh, Mayo's near miss in um, uh, when Royston. they went to, well, yes when they went to Royslip and uh, escaped with their lives in extra time uh, two flights knock Waterford Waterford South End because it was the cheapest way to go and Lee who was a sub at the time said uh, they were wandering around the hotel in Watford there was lads eating bags of jelly babies there was lads eating magnum ice creams the day before the match they uh, failed to prepare as Roy Keane would say so it's worth a read Sligo will be taking London very seriously this year you can be sure of that and they probably won't be taking two flights to South End and we I think we'll all agree Sligo will probably win that no disrespect to our London friends so chronologically we're moving on to Armagh v Antrim they get the uh Loaded dice end of the preliminary round game in Ulster. Ulster's hard enough. You don't need a fourth game. I, the question here for me is Armagh were experimenting with a new defensive form of football that got them relegated from Division 1. Um, they're playing against a Division 3 team here. Can they abandon that and go back to the 2022 version of Armagh that we all loved and just win this game and end all the angst of the league? Yeah, you were saying about the four games and, and teams uh, also being hard enough and the fourth team just being an added burden. I think Armagh will be quite happy this year to be in the preliminary round. <laughs> uh, particularly drawing Antrim because Antrim are, are probably the, the weakest of, of the Ulster counties this year go, going on league position. And so Armagh should come through this fixture and get themselves up and going for, for then the big matches ahead. But they will be nervy. Uh, they have looked disjointed during the National League. They they played with a huge enthusiasm and it, inj- it injected their whole support with massive enthusiasm over the past few years. They were a brilliant team to watch. Huge performances, very, very exciting team to watch. And they look more stale this year. They're not playing with that same enthusiasm. How much of that is because of this, like Kieran McKeever sort of said that they weren't playing more defensively, but I think everybody looking at them they seem to be like they, they had a huge drive forward in previous years. They had a lot of long ball with hard runners running off into that forward line to, to support those long balls in. And it has certainly been more cagey this year. Even I was looking uh, at the scoring stats, uh, the, the inner nerd was coming out. Last year in the National League, they conceded 98 points. This year in the National League, they conceded 98 points. So defensively, ironically enough, having well, everybody saying they're concentrating on that, it's about the same. But going forward, that, this year they scored 95. Last year they scored 98. And that's two points difference a game. Armagh were in loads of narrow games. Like they could have really easily, they were unlucky to be relegated. It wasn't a, a terrible Division One campaign by any stretch. It had a couple of good wins, a couple of really narrow losses, nothing more than a goal. In, in any of the games, uh, but that decreased attack and threat for whatever reason uh, has impacted them and has impacted the energy of the team. Uh, and and they're going to have to come with a wee bit more of that against Antrim <clears throat> to get that enthusiasm and that energy back into them again. Yeah, um, Eamon, it's like they can say they haven't been playing more defensively, but as, as Enda says, we, it's, kind of, it's kind of obvious. Um, and it hasn't suited them, but you know, you know, joked at the start. It feels like only a week ago the league finals run. It's two weeks since our map played a game. Do you actually think they would have gone away and tried to kind of rewrite their tactics, or like, are they too far down the road now to to do that? Are they is the die cast for Armagh, and are they going to try and continue with this kind of more restrictive? game plan which doesn't only restrict the opposition but seems to restrict them as well so it, do you think they can make changes do you think they want to make changes they can make changes if they want absolutely mikey they have time enough to make changes you know their inter-county teams are so flexible now and the way they train and everything else it wouldn't a couple of weeks is a long time in terms of trying to make tweaks obviously there's not going to be sea changes but it is only a few tweaks they need i I saw Keir McKeever was out and he was adamant they're not more defensive and they're not setting up more defensive. Um, 
you know, to, to end this point, they, they they only scored two goals throughout the league this year, whereas last year they were a goal, a goal threat constantly. And for me, I was at a couple of their games and I just felt that it was their defensive shape that has changed a bit. Like last year, they were willing at times in games, absolutely, they did have all 14 outfield players back in a defensive shape. But a lot of the time, they tried to leave at least one, sometimes two, and sometimes even three up where you had Rian O'Neill close to goal. You had the likes of Rory Grugan playing in between. <clears throat> at times, you did Nugent playing in between. And they had a great balance where they were able to kick in transition and get the ball in, and they were able to get teams in one-on-one -on -one situations. And that's where the goals came from, and that's where the offensive threat came from. That's what made them nice to look at. But this year, they were getting nearly everyone back. They were basing it totally on a counter-attack game. And crucially as well, I think some of their big players that played very well for them last year haven't played as well in the league this year. They've just had a bit of a dip form-wise. That's affected their performances. So uh, I, I would expect a big, big reaction for them. They've, they've got a lot of the injuries back. There's still question mark over Rian O'Neill and Andrew Mernon, but I think a lot of the rest of them are back. And for me, a huge miss, and I mentioned it a couple of times in the, the co-com, was Ben Creeley. He missed all the league. He was he was huge for them last year, and he was excellent on the opposition kick-out, getting a press in place, forcing them out to the middle of the field, and he was very strong in the air, whereas without him in the league, they, they didn't really want the ball coming out long. They were giving up a lot of kick-outs, and again, it took away another opportunity to play a bit of front-foot football. So <clears throat> the fact that he's back, I think we could see them pressing a bit more. I could see, see them playing a bit more of the offensive game they played last year while also still having that strong defensive shape. So um, to answer your question, I think they absolutely can tweak a couple of things. The tweaks will be based on personnel returning, and I'd expect a huge reaction from them this weekend, knowing the personalities in their backroom team um, and the players that they have. I, I'd be expecting a big, big reaction. No, Antrim are going to be sticky, and you know the last time they played a couple of years ago, when Ender was in charge, it was... It took late goals from Tiernan Kelly and Connor Turbis to kind of make the game safe for Armagh. Before that, it was a serious battle and, and Antrim really put it up to Armagh. So Armagh will have that in their head as well. Yeah. Rory, we don't, don't mean to sound romantic about it, Rory, but like from the moment they beat Dublin last year in the league till, you know, till they were knocked out of the championship, they were just, they were a delight, Armagh, Ar Ar not a delight to play against. They were in more schmozzles than, anybody, than everybody else put together, which is part of the attraction for us. But like, they really gave us something. They they just seem they they seem kind of a black and white version of themselves this year or something. It's kind of a shame. Well, yeah, but I think that there's an opportunity to hit the reset button now ahead of the championship. I think they have to win really on Saturday. They have to. I mean, if they were to book, if they were to double down after, uh, there'll be a fourth seed anyway, as we were discussing earlier. Well, well, won't well they? I mean, like if you're going into championship. You, you get relegated and then you follow that up with a defeat at home to Antrim. I think that would create huge unrest, not only within the county, but it might even start to create a little bit of unrest within the dressing room. Um, you know, I, I think they have to win. I think they'll be under a little bit of pressure. I mean, I was looking at Antrim's results. They only lost to, I mean, if you take the Ulster games in particular, seeing as we're going to be heading into the Ulster Championship now, they only lost to Fermanagh by a point, lost to Down by a point, beat Cavan. So that in terms of, you know, Antrim's ability, and like Antrim probably, with all due respect to them, and again, as Enda said, you normally say something disrespectful. I think Antrim <laughs> know that they're going to be playing in the Talchin Cup for 2023, given the path from a preliminary all the way to an Ulster final. So I think that does offer Antrim the opportunity to play with a little bit of freedom which could make them also dangerous. Um, but I think if Armagh are up to anything, they need to win this game. It, it, whatever about going on and having any kind of success in the Ulster Championship, they need to win Saturday. Um, the, on the Antrim side, as I said, Enda brought you in as our crack Antrim expert. You don't get much more expert than being the manager of the team for the previous two years. It's been because when you operate in Division 3 and you're kind of, you know, you're there, there about, you know, they're not creating headlines being, being relegated, they're not creating headlines being, being promoted. Some people might even forget that Andy McEntee is the manager. Like he, he was like a, a wet weekend out of the Mead job and he took the Antrim job, which surprised a lot of people. Um, he hasn't torn up trees, but at the same time, as Rory says, the results haven't been bad. They haven't been getting hosed or anything like that. So 
from what you know, like I wouldn't say they're coming into this game completely devoid of confidence by any means, are they? No, I, I think Andy have, has had a really, really solid uh, start. And actually, the, the, the more you know, the more impressive it is to be to be absolutely straight. I had a few conversations with Andy last year uh, when he was thinking of taking the job and, and that there and a few wee conversations since. And he has dealt with massive injuries during that National League. There was the team, and part of my reasoning for sort of stepping away, the, the team was at a sort of a, a key transition stage and felt like a, a new project. He's done that. He's brought in several new players and he's pushed the players much more physically than what I done in my time. Uh, and I think the results are there. Uh, interesting thing is, during my time there, I always felt I was riding the crest of a wave. Things were going well. We're getting good results with the promoter. But... And, and then when it dipped, it dipped badly right at the end. They went through a tougher start. They've had a couple of tough results, a couple of disappointing ones where they were well in pole position in games and just lost it right at the end. Like for Mana and Down, they were the better team in both them games and managed to lose them. Uh, but that will have built up. The fact that they've bounced back, a win against Calvin was massive. Brilliant, brilliant performance. Uh, and so they've got a resilience because they've lost the games and they've been through that. They've answered those questions. They've went away, took the criticism from outside and come back with really good results. That gives good confidence. Certainly, it seems a very happy squad at the minute. They're physically bigger than what they were last year. The injuries are clearing up. They're one of those sort of, I think that 15 injuries at a stage, the majority of them are now coming back. Now, they're still missing a couple of key players, the likes of Dermot McAleese, Paddy McAleer, brilliant players certainly in my time and they will be misses but they've a lot of other players in really good form that's a Paddy McBride is absolutely flying uh, Rui McCann Pat Shivers are all coming on and getting better and better with games and Antrim know the pressure is on Armagh they will know that at times during the National League they have played brilliant football and it's a matter of putting that all together uh, but the same feeling that I had coming into that Armagh Championship match whenever I played them was I had no doubt in the world that we could match them but you know that you need wee things to run for you and you know that the wee mistakes that sometimes teams at the lower levels can cough up tend to be punished very ruthlessly by the teams at the top level I don't, so far in the National League I don't see Armagh being as ruthless in terms of the punishment of those things that they were whenever I was coming in to play them but I'd imagine Armagh could recover that that ruthless streak. So for Andy McDee and Antrim, I think the, the body of work they've done in the National League to maintain their Division 3 status despite all the injuries and with a new manager, that's even more difficult to cope with. Uh, but coming in against Armagh, they know if they are at their very top of the game, they fight in that game the whole way, but they'll still need wee things to fall for them and they still need Armagh to be maybe missing the ruthless streak that as Eamon was saying, they have missed during the National League. They haven't been hitting the goals in the same way as they used to. I think that's an encouragement for Antrim. And if Antrim can really get at them, Armagh's going to get nervous. Really nervous, really quick. Uh, and the wee doubts can seep in, but Antrim have to bring a big, big game to, to get those doubts to the surface in Armagh. Okay. Um, we're, 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 we're pushed for time, so we're just going to have to see. Uh, is anybody disagreeing with an Armagh win here? Anybody no. have a sneaking suspicion for Antrim? No. Um, I know it hurts you to say that end I I think you're making a fair case for them, you know, at least if not upsetting the apple cart, at least uh, uh, giving it a good jostle. Um, okay. Um, the next game chronologically is um, Leitrim and, and New York, and we'll push on from that one as well. Even though I'm hearing, I'm hearing there's uh, there's murmurs. This is a good New York team. I do love these murmurs. You get them most years, Rory, don't you? Yeah, this, yeah. this this is the year for New York. Uh, you never much, know. You much never like know. Cork, you, much like Cork winning in Killarney, it has to happen you, sometime. You never know. You never know with New York. Like to be a couple of Kerry men and a couple of Galway lads over there that you might not have heard of, but be serious ballers, and all of a sudden you're going, "Where did this fella crop out of?" Like you know. Yeah. So it there. The, the, there it, are it, it took extra time for Leitrim the last time. Yeah, yeah that right might it. be where it's coming from. I think I think they, they I think New York's odds are relatively short for a for a three horse race. It's uh, <clears throat> they're not they're they're not massive underdogs, which I think is making some people interested. And you know, that game's live on GA Go at uh, eleven p.m. on Saturday night. If you want to stay up and the golf is not doing it for you. Um, Okay, so we will move on to what is probably the big game of the weekend. Let's uh, let's be honest. Um, live on RTE two and RT Radio and the RT player is uh Mayo versus Ross Common. Um, 
Eamon, this this is all set up for the Ross Common um hijack, let's be honest, an ambush. Um Mayo delighted with themselves winning the league. Um really wanting to celebrate, but not being able to celebrate because they're near neighbours and perhaps bitterest rivals. Who knows? It's hard to say up in Connick. They all hate each other so much. But uh <laughs> Ross Ross Common and <laughs> Ross Common's rivalry with everybody seems to be really keen. Let's put it that way. And I can just imagine yeah, I would imagine you are ending this situation being Davy Park, just rubbing your hands together saying you get to watch them on the telly, you get to see their best team out, you get to have a little thought about it and you know that your lads are all well and at home and on their foam rollers, etc. And nice and rested. It's 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 kind of a dream scenario for a manager like Davy Burke, I'd imagine. It is. It's teed up for them nicely. And uh, in fairness to Davy Burke, I've really enjoyed him throughout the league. Mm. I've enjoyed his, uh, first of all, I've enjoyed his work, but I've enjoyed his interviews and his mm. post-match stuff. He's very, um, he's unlike the rest of us when we're in that position and it's all very measured. He's very, he, he just he's, shoots he's from He's honest, the isn't he? Yeah. He's very honest and yeah. he's kind of infectious and he's a great, uh, he seems to have a great personality. So, you know, if, having someone like that in the dressing room, I can see how he's, he's, he's driving the, the, the Roscommon lads. Um, I saw he did a bit of media stuff this week and he just mentioned the biggest thing that he felt that Roscommon needed was structure and that he's put its structure in place. And obviously he has the likes of Mark McHugh, Jerry McGowan, the background there helping him with that. But they, he, he said they're taking fierce pride in their defending and keeping the score down at the back. And, you know, when you put into the, the natural forwards that they, they've always had in fairness, then you add in the likes of Ben O'Carroll, who's been excellent this year. I think Keith Dyle in midfield has been a huge find for them as well. And he's he's brought a different um, kind of set of attributes to midfield that they might have lacked over the last couple of years. And when you're looking at all of that, it, it's, it's, it really is putting together a great package. And then as well as that, they've shown massive resilience in a lot of the games where they came from behind, even the day against Mayo, I think Mayo went maybe six or seven nil up in that oh, league man. game and Ross Common fought all the way back. They got the late goals. They made it a contest at the end. They similar against Tyrone when they won, similar against Armagh, similar against Kerry. They came right back at them at the end. And even if you go back to last year's Division Two league final before Davy Burke came, they got the last minute goal against Galway. So they seem to have this fierce competitiveness and resilience so they're going to be they're going to be a tough nut, and like you said, they're going in a way they're going to feel like it's a bit of a free shot. Everyone is talking about Mayo and how well they're going. They're the league champions. All is well in in the land of Maxey and the land of Mayo. So it's a perfect opportunity to have to have a shot at mm-hmm. them. So yeah, really looking forward to this game at the weekend, and have been impressed with Roscommon and have been impressed with Davy Burke. I have to say. Yeah, Rory, we we did we talked a lot about Mayo last week, so or on Monday, so I don't think we need to go too much into them. It's nicer to focus on Ross Common, and it helps because Ross Common fans get very very shirty when you when they feel they're being dismissed or ignored. They they really do. Um, it's my favorite question. Yeah, it's my it favorite question. <laughs> favorite question to you, Rory, always is when you look at the spine of that team. It's another one, isn't it? It's uh, Ross- well, Brian Stack. I'm Brian Stack. Old- yeah, Brian Stack, like, uh, you know, I think you look at the chances are it's going to, he'll probably pair off against Aidan O'Shea again. You know, a fantastic pairing. I think a massive blow is Tygo Rourke, um, gone for the season, uh, Achilles. And I think that is a dagger blow for them in an overall context. Uh, given the fact that he fulfilled a number of different roles around that middle eight for them, he could slot in at midfield, he could slot in at wing back. He got through a harsh amount, a harsh of amount of work, you know, in terms of blocking, uh, tackles. He was always, he very rarely saw the full seventy, but that was nearly because he always, you know, spent everything he had when he was out there. And I think him gone, I think he might have been their vice captain. And I think he was actually even mentioned by um Davy Burke uh, as uh, as as you know as like you know uh, the significance of his loss is going to be very very keenly felt from their point of view might not affect him this week but um fine margins i mean nothing between them in the end in the league 
you know, a two point win for Mayo maybe should have been a bit more comfortable and allowed Ross Common back into a game that possibly didn't have any real right to late rally. They have a habit of doing that, Ross Common. Like if this game is tight, they still if this game is tight, or even if it's not, they won't give up. Like they had a late rally. Um, they scored two three in the last fifteen minutes versus Mayo to tart up the scoreboard. Scored two three versus Galway in the last ten minutes of last year's Connacht final. The problem for them is they left themselves with a lot to do. I mean, look, they will fight in their backs, as Ger Nan used to say, but they can't afford to play a game of comebacks because I just think this Mayo team doesn't do panic. There won't be any brain farts out of them. They're steady enough in closing games out, which, as we know, is a euphemism for foul your way to the full-time whistle. Um, but I think, uh, you know, look at from Ross Common started the league like a train, wobbled a wee bit midstream, Recovered on the final leg against the Donegal side that had already been relegated. One other, one other point that I would just think is worth mentioning. They haven't really made a very serious impression on the national stage, from my memory, for a long time. Uh, I think the last big win in the championship, potentially at national level, is our man. You're going back maybe five years at this stage. Like, oh, lost all three Super 8s games subsequently to that. So most of their statement wins tend to come within the province of Connacht. They tend to beat Rot Mayo, beat Galway, and do it regularly. And I think it's set up for them on Sunday. Yeah. And uh, they they have exactly what you need to, to beat this Mayo team, I think, which is a very, very solid defense. They've only conceded three goals in the league, which is which is impressive. Um, so they have a defense that could should be able to live with this red hot Mayo attack. And then Speaking of red hot attacks, I think in the first three four weeks of the championship, we were all drooling over the Ross Common selection of forwards, not the Mayo ones. Um, you know the the Murtas and the Smiths no longer being relied upon in, entirely, and the pre mentioned Ben O'Carroll has been you know one of the best players of the championship. So they have the balance that they have. Absolutely, have. I don't think anybody is coming into this saying just because Mayo won the league they're red hot favourites. I think everybody realizes that Ross Common are a fifty fifty shout, if maybe a little bit less than that for this game. Absolutely. Uh, I think we're all secretly just hoping that there's a wee bit of drama to Mayo season. How boring would it be if Mayo yeah, just yeah. continue on good form the whole season? Like, my yeah. God, the world's crazy enough without that. Sort of <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Roscommon, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I look at, I rewatched the league finally again because the more I thought of it, Mayo, are, they are so eye catching. They're fast attacks, like they attack probably, they get more fast attacks in and they do hit a lot of long ball in than probably any other team. But they're they're almost now dependent, certainly in the league final, they were dependent on those fast attacks. Only maybe three times during the game did they have actually slow multi-phased attacks, which is obviously the, is such a common thing in the game. And they didn't score from any of them. Uh, they got quite a few frees, some of them, potentially a wee bit softer than what they'll get in the championship, keep them in it. And they coughed up, what, four or five goal chances to Galway? In the second half, they didn't score from play, I don't think. Uh, so the Red Hot Mayo attack, absolutely, whenever they're on top form and they're getting that bit of freedom, the, the long balls are absolutely key. Not just the long, the longer, and it's not, often it's quite measured ball into the full forward line, but they particularly release out of defence with a longer ball, and then get chasing it up afterwards and get the opposition stretched. And then with the wee spaces, it's one or two passes up front and, and the shots away. But the long ball out of defence is absolutely critical. Roscommon have to stop, for me, Roscommon have to stop those out balls. They have to force Mayo into a possession game up front. Then Mayo seem to rely on sort of a hor uh, sort of a horizontal cut off the sideline more than really anything else. But it, Mayo are not comfortable in a keep possession game and a slower phased attack. So Roscommon, with that pride on defensive work that Davy Burke's coming, they can make things really uncomfortable. They have to, May are going to come into this game massively confident. They want to go. They've got players on in good form who might feel that they didn't play particularly well in the league final and want to really go on now. They sort of feel as if they're really getting into their stride. Roscommon have to make it a bit of a drag. And throughout the National League, one of the patterns in Roscommon's games, most of them, bar the Kerry one, where Kerry absolutely blitzed them at the start, was really slow sort of target starts. And then it becomes more open. Uh, I think Roscommon need to keep this game quite slow, quite compact defensively, kill a bit of this Mayo wave of enthusiasm, certainly kill their fast attacks, make Mayo go slower. 
And they have the setup to do that. And Mayo, defensively, you'd have to question them again, Galway. When your goalkeeper is man of the match, there's always issues. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. I think that was noticed. Okay, predictions then. Eamon, will it be uh, will it be Roscommon control or Mayo chaos who's going to win out? Uh, I'll go the other way. Mayo control to win, Mikey. They'll continue to surf the wave. But uh, as you know well, I'm useless at predictions, so that, that could go anyway. I wouldn't be surprised, obviously, if Roscommon won. I think it is teed up nicely for them, but... I think Mayo Mayo are in a great place, and I think they'll they'll continue to surf that wave at the moment. Rory, I I, I just think it's classic. Go up to Castle Bar. All the talk about Mayo, all the chin wag about them. I just think it's set up. It's a it's the perfect situation for us coming, and we've seen it so often. So yeah, I think they'll I think they'll uh, they'll soften Mayo's cough a wee bit. But sure, that'll be no harm. Yeah, and uh, Enda. No, I would still go with Mayo. I can make a case for Roscommon, uh, but the injury to Ty O'Rourke and just more informed players for Mayo, I, I think Mayo will get the job done. I think the lack of chalk ices, magnums and jellies on the day before will see Mayo through. <laughs> and the fact they don't have to take two flights to Castle Bar. Um, okay, uh, then finally, uh, there are games happening in the Leinster Championship, everybody, and there'll be highlights of them on the Sunday game. That concludes our coverage of the Leinster Championship for this week. Mm. Uh, I'm allowed to say that because I'm for Leinster and my team are playing, but like Wexford v Leash, don't ask me to preview it, please. Uh, so finally, we're going to look at one game in Munster, um, and um, Rory Rory wouldn't come on the podcast today unless we talked about it. It is a um, huge game. Mikey, Mikey, just one thing. I think it's very important. Sometimes people lose sight of this. It should be mentioned, right? What's your metric for gauging whether or not who's the most successful at any given time. It's all Ireland titles, isn't it? Yeah. Who's won the most all Ireland titles? Do we or do we measure it on league football? No, you've measured on all Ireland. Measuring yes. all Ireland titles. So which province would you think is the number one province on that metric? <laughs> the one the one that carries oh wait, oh no, is it a trick question? Is no, it it's not a trick question. Is it Leinster? No, it's not a trick question at all. It's Munster by a mile. Oh, yeah, I thought by, it was. Then I thought you were tricking mile. me because it was such an obvious answer. Yeah, yeah. Damn so, it, doubted and, myself. And of course, and of course, Kerry have been significant contributors to that, but not exclusively, you know. Um, if you're going to measure it across club, intermediate, senior, junior, across the board. And I know sometimes the Munster football championship is knocked, and that's because you do have a very strong team in there. But... Like, I think sometimes people lose sight of the fact that, you know, it is the top province in football and hurling. It's just the hurling version gets a lot more attention and a lot more glamour because that's what people follow down in Munster for the most part. Um, and I think this game this weekend, while again, will have a reasonably good crowd, will be slightly hidden away. It's huge. It's a huge match. A huge match. He's and talking think, about Clare v Cork in Cusick Park yeah, and then yeah, it's, it's, 2 p.m. on Sunday, by the way. <laughs> it's a very, 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 very significant game. And um, yeah, I'm, you know, I can't wait. I'm really looking forward to it. And I think it's a game that both teams have to win. Uh, okay, so who's going to win it, Roy? Well, like if Cork lose, I think it's like, and I think that brings pressure. I think it's, again, it not only one step forward, two steps back, it'll be one step forward, three steps back in that mm. scenario. Like, because this will be their third time having to go up to Clare and win, having won the two that you could maybe argue, now look, obviously the league game was important too, but having won the two that, you know, would have been lesser significance and then to go up and actually play the third game. And lose that one, I think, would be a death knell. I think the, for their season, for their confidence, for their development under John Cleary, who I think is doing a good job. But this isn't going to be easy. I think they've got some very, very good players. Hurley is fit. Shanley is out. Uh, looks like Ty Cockery is coming back into the mix. Daniel O'Mahony picked up Sigerson Cup Player of the Year. I think he's, his suspension's over after being obviously sent off against Loud. Massive player for Cork at full back. And they've got a little bit more depth up front. But, like, you look at that Clare team, Emmett McMahon, one of the best players I saw playing Sigerson Cup this year. Unbelievable player. Dave, they have a very good guy there as well. Igueru, I think Ike Igueru, he's kind of forced his way into the team, playing wing back, a superb player. Um, there'll be a rabid local crowd. 
we know what the West like game and you know just as well as I do what the Clare West the West Clare football folk are like you know they can be quite vocal and they'll let you know so no this is this is a melting pot game in a big way and you, I think Cork need to win but that's not a gimme mm. and it's interesting there's two teams coming in with very probably pretty different moods you'd imagine like Cork didn't get promoted probably weren't really hanging their hat on getting promoted given the Dublin and Derry were in the league but they finished with a stirring what was it an eight point comeback against Derry to end Derry's 100% record whereas Clare on the other hand started reasonably well had a couple of unfortunate defeats and then their division two like residency was ended which is you know so Colin Collins kind of tasting disappointment in the league for the first time so it's a new challenge for him, even though he's the longest serving manager by country mile at this stage, isn't he? Like this, this is something new for him to have to pick up his players for the Munster Championship, as opposed to being able to say, look at your body of work from the spring, lads, you're grand. Now it's slightly different, isn't it? Yeah, it is slightly different, but they'll, they'll, they'll not fear Cork and they'll know the generosity of Cork people will give them chances very likely yeah. in this game. Cork, <laughs> it's I, a very I, good point. And uh, yeah, yeah. Cork, Cork are a brilliant team to watch at the minute. They, they play, they've played phenomenal football. Some of the performances was excellent in the league, but they just seem to lack a uh, solidity or a game management. I, I don't know if game management exists down in, down in Cork, but uh, they, they, I loved watching them. I think Brian Hurley being fit is, 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 massively important obviously for them he remains a key key man for them uh, but they, they they just give the opposition chances they they play with the freedom and they give the opposition chances and Claire will know that and Claire will know that they were unlucky they had a lemony snickets of a league campaign like it just it just didn't go for them they could have been much further up the table but they are where they are mm. I, I think they, they can certainly gather the troops and, and go at Cork with a really strong performance. I think if they were playing Kerry, I think that's a different scenario getting them up for it. But I don't think at home, I don't think they'll fear Cork and they'll relish the chance of getting at Cork, knowing, just as Rory was saying, he's absolutely right, Cork's under pressure. Cork have an expectation of themselves. But it's almost as if I haven't seen from this current Cork crop that they relish that real pressure of a big championship match and just going out and producing a really solid professional job and getting the job done. They'll go out and they'll play brilliant football. But I could well see them getting caught by Clare, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, Eamon, how big a factor is Cusick Park then? Because we know we, we hear about it, talked about in hurling a lot. Oh, it's a tight ground, the crowd are on top of you. Guess because Clare football isn't a story, does Clare hurling? We don't hear about it as much. Is the crowd and the pitch, is it a factor when you're going up there to play them? It, it, it is, it is. It's certainly, they make the home advantage. Come on, it's actually a big pitch. It just plays tight because of the, the nature of the stands at both sides. The supporters are in on top of you. As Rory mentioned, they are quite vocal and they do get involved in the game. But the surface in the pitch, it's a lovely place to play. It's actually, as a player, it's a lovely place to play. But both times that we went up there in my time managing, we had, we had sticky encounters with them 2014. Uh, we won well enough in the end, I think, but it was a tough battle. And 2017, then we come off winning the league and we were, Donica Welch was sent off in the first half. We were a man down. We were two or three points yeah. down at half time. We were playing into the wind in the second half and we right. really had to, you know, Brian Sheehan, Brian Sheehan kicked some big scores in that second half, if I remember. Amen, Brian Sheehan and I think James O'Donoghue came on as a sub as well. He, right, he'd yeah. been coming back from an injury and I think he made a big difference. We played well in the second half, especially bearing in mind we were down to 14, 14. but we needed to and we, we dug it out and it was actually a great win. I was delighted with it afterwards, but it is, it's going to be a tough, and like, look for, for Clare. Clare were in the All-Ireland quarter final last year. Beat Ross Common. Yeah, that's where and they lead. see themselves. That's that's where they see themselves, and they're going to react to the league. But having said that, I think the Cork are coming big time. And I, I, I've been impressed with them. Like Enda says, I do think they have a bit of tidying up to do. I think the fact that Kevin Welch is in the backroom team there, he'll... He he's embedded into the setup at this stage and he'll be getting more and more time with the players and he'll be making more of an impact. But uh, I, I just think they have so many quality young players that don't have the baggage of the past and they're coming, they're coming like a train, I think. 
Um, but it comes to the point that they have to go and do it. And these are the kind of games they have to go and win. They have to go and win this game above there. And it's a big step if they do it. I, I think getting the likes of Brian O'Driscoll and Rory Dean back as well was very clever from, from John Cleary. I felt last year there was a leadership deficit and just that experience deficit there. But I think by getting those two in particular back and Brian O'Driscoll has been playing he, I know he missed a part of the league injured, but I was impressed with the role he played when he was playing. That more pragmatic role that Enda was talking about there, I think he brings that bit of pragmatism to them. Um, Hurley and his shoulder being right is big, but I, I think Cork are going to win, and I think they're going to. I think they're going to have a say in the championship this year. I just think they're they're coming, and they have a lot of good young players. And I think if they build a bit of momentum, Cork with momentum are always dangerous. Yeah, here you go, I have been talking about Cork. Pat, Pat's plans <laughs> That's in, actually genuine. That's no, genuine. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. Quickie, genuine. Uh, Rory, he's going to win? Yeah, look, I, look I, I think Eamon is right. I do think that they're building a, a new team, a new panel. <clears throat> They've got a, a bit of depth there as well. I mean, looking at the lads that potentially will be subs, for instance, this Sunday coming, it'd be quite instructive. Killian O'Hanlon is starting to get fitness back after having a massive injury for an awful long time. I'm hearing Damien Gore potentially is back in the mix. As I said, Ty Corkery potentially back in the mix. I think he's a, there's, there's a lot to come from that young lad. Like he's still only 24. He hasn't played a huge amount of inter-county football. Again, through, through, through injury, he's from the same club as, uh, as Noel O'Leary and he would be cut from similar cloth um, in terms of uh, the abrasive nature that he brings to his football. So I think in terms of the panel and, and an overall context i think they need to win and i think in terms of building that new new team with powder and all of these different types of players i think it will be essential that they win on sunday but that brings pressure and i think claire will relish that and claire are not a bad side to go back to my earlier point about monster football <laughs> finally then enda do you can you see an upset here do you think cork are gonna are gonna do it i uh... I would love Cork to do it because I, I would love the sense of a strong Cork coming, to be honest. And I, as I say, I think of all the teams in the top two divisions, at times they played probably some of the best football in during the National League. Uh, but I just think this is, as much as the Connacht one is set up for a scrum and ambush, I, I think Clare and Podge Collins will, uh, will be relishing this one. Oh, oh, there we go. Uh, I love to get on the back of a, of a good shock, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to go with Cork here myself. Finally, and I, I, I literally want a one-word answer with no ums and as here, because I tried this after Mon on Monday's podcast and the lad's head's nearly exploded. Rory, this time, without without who's going to win the All-Ireland, Rory? <laughs> I actually, I, I, I said this again, and I do believe it'll be Kerry Dublin final. And... Um... I think if Kerry sort themselves out to a degree, and I think when I say sort themselves out, I just think they kind of had a stop start for him. So I'm going, I, I think they could go back to back. I think, yeah. I'm okay. Go with Kerry. Eamon, I'm surprised you haven't left the meeting anyway, <laughs> such as your fondness for, for, for predictions. Well, I don't want an explanation. Well, I'll say Kerry. Name. I'll go with Kerry, Mikey. I go ah, the boy. The boy. Yeah. Go on. Enda. Dublin just to be different. Okay, and I said Mayo on Monday, so I'm sticking with them. I'm, I'm getting off the Galway hype train, Eamon, so the, you should probably put all your money on Galway. Say, the they're, they're now. Now, okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, look, lads, thanks very much. I enjoyed that chat. Um, and now, in a moment, to preview the Allianz Hurling League, Jackie Tyrrell is going to join us, because the leagues aren't over yet. A little small matter, the Division 1 Hurling final do. But Enda, Eamon, enjoy the football this weekend, and myself and Roy will be back in a second. Uh, we're back. We've been joined by Jackie Tyrrell to preview the final game of the Allianz Hurling League, which logically enough is the final, uh, which is between a, re a rerun of last year's All-Ireland final, Jackie Limerick versus Kilkenny. Um, this isn't probably the level of revenge that Kilkenny are looking for. And there's a logic out there that, Jesus, if you're only going to beat Limerick once in a year, you can do it in the All-Ireland final. I hate that logic. It's stupid. If you can beat him once, you can beat him twice, as I so. um I'd imagine are are you are you bane for blood down there? I wouldn't say bane for blood, Mikey, but I suppose when you you weigh that up makes the it, that makes that makes a change, Jackie. I know. <laughs> well, I suppose when, when your manager for twenty four years leaves, it is a huge time of change. So 
you know, the backdrop is Derek Ling is a, a new manager taking on that position. Um, a, a, a relative amount of change of new guys coming in. Game plan, small tweaks and changes here and there, but not a huge radical change. So when you see the kind of uncertainty that that presents and you're up against the green monster, um, you know, expectations are, are quite muted down here and you factor in then that it's in Cork and there just seems to be a lot of unrest among the locals with, with that decision. Easter Sunday, uh, trying to get out of Cork at quarter past four is a bottleneck. So, you know, people are kind of holding back and, and mightn't travel, which is unfortunate. Um, and might take a small bit from it from an atmospheric point of view and, and a number point of view. But look, in Kilkenny, we always have high expectations, no matter who we're playing. And there will be a, an expectation that the guys go there, they front up, they take this Limerick team on, that we don't sit back, we don't bring loads of bodies back. Of course, there'll be times you do that. But we have a real go at them and we'll ask some questions like we did in the All-Ireland final. And that's kind of the, the mood in Kilkenny at the minute, guys. Mm. Just on the venue, Rory, because... Uh... Everybody loves Parky Cueve. It's a glorious stadium. Um, brilliant place. It's a brilliant setting for it. It it is, but from obviously Thurlis would have been the logical place. You would have you probably doubled the Kilkenny crowd if it was held in Thurlis, let's be brutally honest. I'm just surprised, and this is not to do down the footballers of Tipperary and Waterford. I'm quite surprised the Tipperary County Board didn't toss them out and send them down to Clamell or Tip Town once once this kind of this arose because it, it must it was foreseen i would guess so, like and i thought at first oh yeah should I? the league finals always in thurlis it's not it hasn't it's only been in thurlis once as a standalone final in the last four or five years it's been all around the place it's been in kilkenny it's been in limerick it's been in crow park so it's not always in thurlis but i'm just a little bit surprised i didn't think the, the tip footballers had such a high standing among their own there's absolutely nothing on on Saturday night, really, in a hurling context. Seven o'clock, five o'clock. I know Armagh are playing. That's on BBC. But I'm sure, you know, I don't know whether or not there would have been precluding TG Carr from going up against that, given it's in another jurisdiction, technically. Um, I just think maybe shifting the game to Saturday night would have opened up Tarlis for you. And I, I don't understand why the game had to be on Sunday for a start. Like, I, that to me, you know, it's kind of swamped with the start to the football championship. Whereas if you had shifted it to Saturday night, it would have maybe freed up Thurlis, maybe would have actually given more Kilkenny people the opportunity to go down to Cork, make a night out of it. I don't know. It just seemed an opportunity missed. But I do think Cork is a better, better, it's a better setting and a better stage for a national final. I love Thurlis. I'm going to Thurlis since I went to Thurlis for the first time in 1984 for the centenary final. I was eight years of age with my father for Cork and Offaly. Love the place. It's a, a mythical, very fifth special place in the heads of hurling hurling people and hurling supporters all over Ireland, right? But Thurlis is starting to become run down a fair bit now. You know, it's not the most pleasurable of experiences. Toilets, shops, all those types of things aren't, you know, I'm not necessarily saying fit for purpose, but, you know, look, Cork is just better. It's a better ground for all of that, <laughs> right? It's a better stadium. It's like, it's a bright, it's new. It's new. And I think for sure a, Rory has it on a t-shirt, Cork is better. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I just think Parky Creep is a fine ground in terms of, it's brand new, effectively, in a stadium context. It has, the mod cons are good. The pitch is in amazing condition. Um, it's akin to Croke Park, which I think hurling, you know, doesn't play there often enough. So I think if you're going to have the next best thing for a national final, I think Park Creeve is a good setting for it. But if mm. the crowd is going to be affected, that's a pity. But I don't see anything wrong with sending the match down there. Sure, there's an hour for Limerick. Like, I mean, it's mm. as much to go to the Cork for Limerick people as it is to go to Turles. So. Yeah. Um, Jackie, the logic is if Kilkenny are to win this uh, final, those Parky Cueve nets will have to billow a couple of times. Um, noticeable teams aren't scoring too many goals against Limerick, which is obvious, as you pointed out on League Sunday a couple of weeks ago, given the, the full back line they have and the goalkeeper they have. But then the counter argument is the Kilkenny inside forward line looks pretty threatening this year. It's a nice mix of, uh, you know, kind of pace and ingenuity with a good focal point like Marty Keown there. So um, if anyone can score goals against them, we'd like to think it'd be Kilkenny. Yeah, look, we demonstrated that in the All-Ireland last year, and you'd like to think that there's more goals in this team. Um, but you are right, Mikey, you have to score goals uh, because Limerick, more more times than not, they'll, they'll outshoot you from out the field. 
people with their with their peerless shooting from you know particularly their half hour nine or half back line they just they just are so awkward and they create the extra man and they take the shot at the right time and they, they remind you of the dubs a lot and that they, they they they're patient and that they'll wait to bring the ball into that zone where they're so awkward from so Kilkenny will have to get goals and and there is goals in this team I suppose from the all-earned final point of view, you're probably down TJ Reid and Adrian Mullen, which takes away a small bit of that that threat up front. But look, in Billy Dreddon, there's probably someone there new who can maybe create something different that Limerick probably aren't used to or, or don't really know a whole lot about. But look, the market leaders is Sean Finn and, and Barry Nash, and they're well used to taking on these things. So, But Kilkenny will, will target goals and will probably target maybe the aerial ball into the square. Mossy Keown is quite strong and robust and see if we can get some traction there. But there will be times that those goals that were created with Kenny last year was because they put three in the full forward line and asked that question and had bodies in there. And when Wally Welsh ran down the right wing and cut back in and Billy Ryan would end up in the net, there was bodies in there to take the pass off. And so that's what Kenny will commit to. Of, t- of course, at times they will draw a body, but for large portions of the game, they will need to commit to three inside. But the thing that Kenny will need to do, and what I think is key in this, and you look back at the All-Ireland final, when Limerick have their dominance, and there's no doubt they'll have their dominance, and we see how they blitz teams, they wiped out the lead again, tip in 10 minutes, how can Kenny hang in? And they have a great ability at hanging in, and you think of the All-Ireland final, the first half last year, they just won an odd free here, TJ just kept kind of taking them over, so when Limerick are in that period of ascendancy, we need to keep the scoreboard ticking, we just need to stay hanging in there, because Limerick are so, so... Detriment, they're so dangerous in that period where they can just kill a team off, and particularly that that third that third period of the game. So that will be crucial for Kilkenny. I'm sure <clears> it's something like Eric Ling and them will be planning for. Is Billy Drennan is Billy Drennan heading for the dungeon, Jackie? <laughs> Is he he's, another he's, one? He's, he's probably he in the elevator now to minute. Whether he can get out with now, glory is, is it's a big ask for a young chap in his first year. I just think these lads are phenomenal. I don't think they get the credit for it. like. I, I was trying to think of Sean Finn. I think Alan Cadigan gave him a, a rough time a number of years ago where he got maybe two points off him in the round robin, two or three <laughs> points, and that was a, probably his worst day at the office. He's just <laughs> phenomenal, and Barry Nash is phenomenal mm. going both ways, you know. So, yeah. um, it's, and, th- it's, and those boys are playing for a place on the championship team. As I said, there's, uh, there's four, there's four frontline front contenders to play in three full back positions. It's yeah. mental, isn't it? Yeah. And, and it's even, I was even thinking of Colin Coughlin who's had a decent league campaign, a good Fitzgibbon. He's probably going for the number seven jersey, excuse me. <clears throat> You'll probably have Kyle Hayes ahead of him. You'll probably have Dan Morrissey, Colin Coughlin. You know, and even if he has a good league final this weekend, he's probably turned the pecking order there. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's yeah. just, it's just silly. Like, the, just mm. the strength, Rory, mm. John Kyle has. And, and we've talked about him. There's no point in going into it again. But we talked with Mayo in the football they went with their strongest team and that was good for them. They won the title, but it did let Ross Common look at them and say, oh, okay, right. Well, that's that's what we're going to be facing this weekend. John Kiley, do, do you think, like, does he have a strongest team? Does he need to have a strongest team? Is he a horses for courses manager now because he has so many, so many chances, Rory? Like, you know, he has so many options. Or does he have, do you think John Kiley in his head, this is my first 15. This is if I need to obliterate the opposition and I want to do that to Kilkenny this weekend. This is my I- first 15. I think he's in a very similar place to Jim Gavin when Dublin were in their pomp and when uh, Brian Cody had Jackie and Jackie's team in their pomp in that there's probably three or four interchangeable fellas that just won't significantly weaken them in any way. And I think if you have that, you have incredible competition internally and that's just going to drive the whole thing on. It makes them almost impregnable in some ways. And if you take William O'Donoghue's situation, he got suspended and uh, I think they've just accepted it. And I think in a roundabout way, that might be, you know, again, it just shows we don't want distractions. We don't want, you know, to get bogged down in legal challenges. Maybe William did something on the field that John Kylie feels was incorrect. And he wants to maybe, you know, say, look, you've got to hold your discipline. Teams will look to try and wind us up a bit more. Teams will look to poke the bear. And it's about not reacting to that and it's about staying focused. And maybe that's the lesson that he's trying to teach William O'Donoghue by not challenging it. And William's going to lose his place this week. Could that affect William? No, I don't think so because he's such a 
presence and he's such an enforcer in that midfield for Limerick. He's I one man whose place is probably assured even if he misses a game. Yeah, like, I mean, he's uh, just a colossus for them. Like, uh, and you have to bear in mind when they started on their journey, William Dunne, who was not first choice. Now, that's going back five or six years. I mean, he. He has worked hard to force his way into the into the reckoning. But look, you'd imagine it's going to be Darrow, Donovan, and Keane Lynch will just drop into midfield. That's okay, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think that, I think they'll survive. Okay, Jackie, we're we're a bit pressed for time after an abundance of football talk this week. Can you imagine the audacity of us to talk about football for so long? Who's going to win, Jackie? Look. I'm a realist. I do look at this Limerick team and just think that they're like a runaway train at the minute. And Kilkenny probably need another time to kind, of, another bit of time to really pull this group together and identify what their best fifteen, which I don't think they fully know. Is. So I'm, I'm, I feel Limerick will win this weekend. Um, I don't think it'll be a runaway league final. I do think Kilkenny will hang in there for long periods, um, but I'm expecting Limerick to win maybe four or five points. Yeah, I I think a Limerick win too. Rory, can you go against that? No, a Kilkenny's ability to execute the basics, the hook and block and getting a body in, making sure, like, I mean, if you go back, as Jackie mentioned, the last year's All-Ireland final, whereby they made that such an unbelievable contest, I think, for long stretches. And it's just because they're just masters at the basics and it always gives them a chance. But I think from a Limerick perspective, the respect that they have for Kilkenny will mean that they will treat this game with a fair bit of vigor. And I'd ex- I like I think they'll they'll go all out, and I think they'll they'll win. But I think Kilkenny will give them plenty of it. But Limerick to win. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's on TG Carr. Obviously, and you can listen to it on RT Radio One, and you can follow it on the RT Sport website and the RT News app, as you can all the other G over the weekend. And as we mentioned. Um, you can watch the uh, New York Leitrim game on GA Go and you've got the Mayo v Roscommon game on RT2 and the RT player. So the championship's here and the league final in Ireland. So it's a good weekend. Jackie, enjoy yourself. Rory, enjoy yourself. And we'll be back here on Monday. So let's chat to you then. by winning the last two matches on the road and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it! He hits it! It's over the bar! Oh! Holy Moses!